Are you struggling to trade part-time while working a full-time job? Well, then this video is for you. I'll talk about my personal part-time trading routine that has allowed me to eventually exit the rat race and become a full-time day trader. I'll also share some amazing strategies and tools for part-time trading, as well as tips and rules to avoid for all time zones. And lastly, the deadly mistakes oh that you're gonna God. want to avoid. I got started trading in my sophomore year of college. The second I found day trading, I wanted to make sure I had an education that in case day trading didn't work out, I could still get a nine to five job. I kind of did it in reverse, but hear me out because I still had a jam packed schedule. First, I double majored in finance and economics. I took on two majors, not just one. I also played a sport, was in a fraternity with a ranking role, as well as balanced a very active social life. All of these considered, it was not necessarily the most amount of time to also trade stocks, but I found a way to fit it in. And today I'm going to tell you about all the tips and tricks I used in order to become a successful day trader while being a part-time student as well as a day trader. Number one, I fit my schedule to make sure I was trading the most active market hours. What does that mean? Well, first of all, I was on the West Coast. I was going to school in San Francisco, California. So market open for me wasn't exactly 9.30 a.m. It was 6.30 a.m. And with that came its own obstacles and tribulations that I had to overcome. First, what is the most important part of the market hours to me? It's going to be the first hour and a half, roughly 6.30 a.m. to 8 a.m. That's where you can see a ton of volatility, a ton of opportunity, and it's time for me to make moves. The first thing I did was I scheduled my classes around knowing that I would be busy during these first two hours, 6.30 a.m. to 8 a.m. That means my first class, whatever it was, could not start before 8 a.m. It had to start at 8.30 or 9. I needed to get into the market. I needed to watch every day. That was very important screen time. Middle of the day, not so important to me, so that's where I scheduled a lot of my classes. And most days I would miss the close and I'll tell you why. The last hour of the day is generally called power hour, 12 to one. And again, you're gonna see a lot of volatility, a lot of volume re-enter the market and things are gonna get spicy again. But you can choose what strategies to implore. I have found strategies that specifically help me trade in the morning and in the afternoon, they weren't necessarily there. In fact, the afternoons were built for scanning for me. So end of the day, I would see what was moving, but I would have no inkling to trade. A lot of the times I don't want to expose myself to the risk. I really wanted to focus on the time that I knew I could be there every day. And that was the morning session. So the next thing I did is I created a strategy. I created a routine. I said, what is my process going to look like? What am I looking to do every day? What is my job? And my job was to do something very specific, which was trade one strategy. Generally, I'd wake up at about 5.15 a.m., I would look at my gap scanner. I would see what's gapping up, what's gapping down. And I would see if certain stocks were fitting a specific pattern of mine. Usually I would end up with about four stocks to watch. And of those four, maybe two end up doing exactly what I want come market open. The first strategy I implored with a part-time strategy was called the first red day. And the second one I would implore is called a gap and crap strategy. Let's get into physical charts and show you exactly the kind of chart patterns that I'm looking for that fit, in my opinion, good part-time strategy allocation. So the first strategy that I became consistently profitable with was called the first red day. And one of the main reasons I loved the first red day was because it was specifically a morning trade. I can execute the trade, enter the stock, exit the stock all within one hour and a half and make my money for the day and be done. By 7 30 there was no other trade i needed to take for that day and it was usually a very quick trade so i want to go into uh an example of one that happened uh quite recently and explain why it is a quick trade so in front of us we have a stock called gme gamestop you might have heard of it it's popular in the meme culture In any case, I don't really care about the meme culture. I care about the specific chart patterns. In the past three days, GameStop had had quite the run, going from a low of 25 to a high of 47, and even having this mini breakout here at 40 bucks. This day on June 7th, which was Friday, is the day that I want to come to the market with kind of a short bias. I'm thinking the stock has gone on a multi-day run. It's extended from where it came from, and a number of other concluding factors that make this set up an A plus scenario. On one hand, we had our famous meme troll stock account, Roaring Kitty. He was going live for the first time to talk about his position. And knowing how kind of rumors work, it's usually buy the rumor and sell the news. 
So despite the fact that I thought this was quite good on a technical standpoint, I also thought fundamental, we have a sell the news event coming up. Now, maybe he discloses something super awesome within the webinar and makes the stock spike, but I couldn't figure out what he could possibly say that would make the stock spike more than it already has. He's already announced his position. Okay, that's number one. Number two, we also had a breakout, you know, a smaller breakout into close. And there's overhead resistance, so this chart is kind of baked with back holders somewhere in this uh, previous run. You know, although this was a really nice breakout on volume, in my mind, there's also a world where it failed. What I thought was more interesting and more a better risk reward scenario, so to speak, is instead of coming in with a long bias uh, at $40 on an extended chart, I thought the risk reward would actually pay out to come in with a short bias if it was weak the next day. So this next day is your typical first red day. Again, it's a little bit more extreme than normal first red days because there was a sell the news event, which actually took the stock down a lot more. But we're going to go over my very simple trade. Again, we closed quite strong the day before. Everyone was expecting it to gap up. Everyone bought the breakout level at 40. You know, they're closed up nicely on their position. And the next day, it gaps down. Anyone that bought into close is immediately underwater. And I think that's what creates a really nice opportunity for myself. Again, not kind of drinking the Kool-Aid and just trying to stay objective about the chart patterns. This is a situation that really opens the door to a quick morning trade because predictably so, you know, if this stock isn't gapping up, if it's not doing what everyone who had bought the day before wants it to do, they become sellers. It can be an overwhelming amount of supply because there are, in theory, more people willing to buy a stock than short a stock on any given move, especially on a bullish pattern like this one. So that's an assumption I kind of make going into market open. In any case, the stock spikes up into previous resistance to where I kind of had a line drawn from the previous day high. I got short into this 48 area and you get this really quick pullback once everyone is either taking profit for break even or, you know, exiting a small loss and then eventually like doom and disaster sets in and, you know, we're 30% below 40 and people start to panic sell. I declare bankruptcy! So again, this is a trade I've taken many times. It capitalizes on the supply and demand imbalance that you get a market open when there's too many people hopeful for the stock to go higher it reverses it's extended there's a lot of range and it has room to come down and again i didn't hold for this whole piece it was kind of a two-part trade for me but i was able to short into 48 and then cover at 39. again just a very quick morning trade all within the first hour and a half and then i would go and do my class that was the first part-time strategy that i really mastered and found consistency with next up we have the pattern called the gapping crap this pattern is also a pattern that I really like for part-time trading, I've created a strategy that allows me not to have to watch the minute by minute tick of the market. Let me explain what I mean by that. First of all, the psychological understanding of gapping craps. Personally, I like to trade small cap. As a trader, you're gonna have to eventually identify what type of markets do you wanna trade? Big cap, large cap, small cap, pink sheets. You get to decide if the world's your oyster. One of the places that I frequently find opportunity is within small cap. The thing about small cap is most of these companies are horrendous. Most of these companies need financing. They need to extrapolate cash and they're going to use volume and liquidity to do that within the markets. So it's my assumption that most of these companies are crap. Of course, some of them are good and you have to kind of be aware of these things and create rules and criteria to kind of avoid obvious landmines. But for the most part, a lot of these are crap and they're trying to find ways to extrapolate money from the markets just like kind of I'm doing, but they're a company doing it. The reason I like gap and craps is because it's on the assumption that, again, I don't want to buy horrible companies. But when horrible companies gap up one, two, three, four hundred percent, my assumption is it's going to be very hard for everyone to agree on this new price. And there might be some downward pressure throughout the day, and it might, you know, revert back to the mean or settle at a price that's maybe slightly above where it came from, but not at the highs, because I don't think most small caps are going to close strong. Again, some will, but the majority, where are the odds? And that's what I'm always trying to do in the market. I'm trying to put myself on where are the best of the best odds. The other thing you have to understand about small cap is since they're trying to make money, there is a ton of manipulation. Whether you think it's legal or illegal or whether you understand it or you don't understand it. Oh, God. Don't take it. No, I have to take it. I can do this. You can't do this. They're going to try to manipulate their stock to achieve their agenda. And not every time are you going to be able to read into their agenda like it's black and white. There's a definitely a gray area within small cap. I've developed a strategy that allows me to kind of ignore their manipulation. I understand that minute by minute, there's going to be wicks up, there's going to be wicks down. But what is the general capability of a stock and where do most of them land? And that's what gives birth to the gap and crap setup. This is an example of one that I took just this last Friday. A uh, stock gapped up from 60 cents to a buck 40 on some news. And again, it's not really for me to disentangle whether the news is good or bad. In general, like I don't think news in small cap deserves 100% of gap ups. I think that is more cycle based. I think a lot of times stocks gap up in small cap because there's retail FOMO chomping at the bid to get involved which pushes the stocks to extended levels and then 
Who knows? Maybe wards come in. Maybe there's bag holders from previous runs. A number of different factors that could lead to overhead selling pressure. So I do like to short these. And the way that I treat over gapping craps is I like to use a wide risk measure. Again, I like to go in with saying, hey, and again, not all of them are worthy of shorting, but the ones that I choose, I like to go in with a specific strategy that says, hey, I want to get short near the open. I want to risk something very wide. And if it tags me, you know, I'll take my loss. But if it does what I think a lot of them will do, which is fade off and fade for the rest of the day, I want to cover near close. So that's an example um, of what that happened on Friday, VERO. I was getting short in the buck 30s. Again, I'm not really risking a buck 59. This is definitely a strategy that takes some time to build an account because there's a lot of volatility in the account because you do take large losses for every large wig that you have. But for me, what, what I like to do is I like to take an entry. I like to risk something super wide and I like to give it the day to unravel. Of course, throughout the day, if it comes back up and stops me out wherever my stop is, I take the loss. But at the end of the day, if it's down below my entry, um, great, it's a win. And if it's a little bit above or break even, then again, I'm just taking it off at the end of the day. So it's less about reading the charts and it's more about understanding criteria wise, which stocks have the best ability to fade. And now that's something that you're going to have to do research. I can't tell you which stocks have the best ability to fade. I just know that small caps have a slight skew towards fading and then kind of putting the pieces in and finding rules and criteria to define which ones uh, have more blatant landmines, which ones can become bigger squeezes and trying your best to obviously avoid those. Um, but I really like this strategy for part time because again, the way that I go about it, it's a wide risk measure. So I don't necessarily have to watch it throughout the day. It either comes and stops me out or I'm covering end of day and I'm generally short near market open. So I can see why that could be a good part-time strategy. Although again, um, if you have problems managing the risk or selecting which stocks to go short on, you obviously can experience a lot of risk. You know, trading these small caps are absolutely risky. Some of them go a thousand percent in a day. So again, I'm a firm believer in stop losses. I just put the order in. So my biggest risk is whether my broker would trigger me or not, or if I come back and try to fight the stock, right? And, and, and balloon the loss, which is another one of my fantastic rules that keep me from doing situations like that so if these are strategies that you want to explore more uh, or if you have any questions you know where to find me i am at clovertrading.io where we do weekly webinars we have watch lists mark up our charts and explain key levels and why we think these levels might interact and if this is something that you want to learn more about to get a sufficient knowledge within the market and market dynamics that's where you can find us thanks everyone and have a good one